Howdy. So what have we learned about gases so far? We've learned that gases are mostly empty space, and so the intermolecular forces between gas particles are typically negligible, and the volume of the gas particles themselves are typically negligible. We've learned that the ideal gas law can be used to calculate the maximum parameters for most gases under com common conditions. And we've learned that the ideal gas law is not accurate when the pressure is too high or the temperature is too low because intermolecular forces become important at low temperature and the volume of the gas particles themselves become important at high pressure. Now this video is on extensions of the ideal gas law. And so while we can use ideal gas law to calculate properties of gases under common conditions, we can also extend the ideal gas law to develop the equation for the density of gases and to derive Dalton's theory of partial pressures. And so after watching this video, you should be able to calculate pressure volume number of moles or temperature when conditions of a gas change. You should be able to describe what affects the density of a gas. You should be able to calculate the density of a gas. You should be able to describe the meaning and significance of Dalton's law of partial pressures. And you should be able to use Dalton's law of partial pressures to calculate the pressure of different systems. So ideal gas law PV equals NRT, pressure times volume equals number of moles times gas constant times temperature. Temperature always has to be in units Kelvin. And again, if we're using the ideal gas law, we're assuming intermolecular forces between gas particles are negligible and the volume of the gas particles are negligible. Now there are some sets of conditions are established to allow comparisons between different data sets. So for instance, STP, standard temperature and pressure, corresponds to zero degrees Celsius and one, one bar, it's used by IUPAC. Standard ambient, ambient temperature and pressure, SATP, defined as 25 degrees Celsius, one bar pressure. Again, that's an IUPAC set. Normal temperature and pressure, NTP, 20 degrees Celsius and one atmosphere. It's developed by NIST. Now, I'm a little bit old, and so I want you to know that STP and treat it as zero degrees Celsius and one atmosphere. It's a little bit different, um, but it's close enough. And so when we say STP, we mean standard temperature and pressure, and we're gonna use the older definition of zero degrees Celsius and one atmosphere. And I don't want you to get confused between STP, standard temperature and pressure, and standard state. Standard state means the most stable configuration for a system. You know, standard state for oxygen is O2 gas, for instance. And so how much nitrogen gas is required to fill a small room with a volume of, of 27,000 liters to a pressure of 745 millimeters of mercury at 25 degrees Celsius? Now we have to get all units in proper, or our data in proper units. Remember, always watch your units. And so temperature has to be in Kelvin. And so to go from Celsius to Kelvin, we add 273. So 25 plus 273 gives us 298 Kelvin. 25 degrees Celsius corresponds to, to 298 Kelvin. Now, if we want to deal with atmospheres instead of millimeters of mercury, uh, one atmosphere corresponds to 760 millimeters of mercury. And so if we divide 745 millimeters of mercury divided by 760 millimeters of mercury, that will give us in atmospheres and we'll get 0.98 atmospheres. And so we've converted to units we can deal with. And so we can start with P vehicles and our T. We're asking for how much. So we solve for N. And so if we divide both sides by RT, we get N equals PV over RT. Now we can plug in our numbers. Our pressure is 0.98 atmospheres. Volume is 27,000 liters. The gas constant, remember there are five different values for the gas constant. You just use the one with the units that match. And so our pressure is in atmospheres. So this is the gas constant we'll use. And then we have temperature 298. And so the way I'd plug this into my calculator, I got 0.98 times 27,000 equals. Then I divide that by 0 0.082. 0, 06 and then I divide that by 298 Kelvin 
And so that gives me 1,082. 1, and you watch your units and you see that, you know, atmospheres cancel atmospheres, leaders cancel leaders, Calvin cancels Calvin. And we're left with one over one over a mole, which actually is a mole. And so you should be able to solve for any of the parameters in the ideal gas law. What is the volume of one mole of CO2 at standard temperature and pressure, STP? And so again, STP, we're in treat as zero degrees Celsius and one atmosphere. And so zero degrees Celsius corresponds to 273.15 Kelvin. Remember, to go from Celsius to Kelvin, you add the temperature in Celsius, you add 273.15 to the temperature in Celsius, and it gives you the temperature in Kelvin. And so with PV equals NRT, we're looking for V, so we divide both sides by P. And then we can plug in our numbers. And so we can see on the calculator again. So we got one mole times 0 0.082058 equals times 273.15 equals, and then we don't need to divide by one. And so that gives us 22.4 liters. And so one mole of CO2 at STP corresponds to 22.4 liters. Now we could ask about for a different gas, the same thing. Now, if you notice, you know, and the question would be, will that be more or less than for CO2? Well, the ideal gas law does not depend on the type of gas. So it should be exactly the same, right? No number here tells you which type of gas you dealt with. All that matters is the number of gas particles. And so if you're calculating for CO2 or if you're calculating for propane, it's the same calculation and you'll get the same result. So one mole of an ideal gas at STP gives you 22.4 liters, no matter what the gas is. And I expect you to actually remember that one mole of ideal gas at STP occupies 22.4 liters. It makes some things a little bit easier. And so what that looks like, you know, the blue cube here is 25 liters. And so that corresponds to one mole of an ideal gas. And if we look at different gases, we can see that, you know, that's really pretty close. So ideal gas is exactly 22.41. Argon, a little bit less. Uh, hydrogen is a little bit more. But in general, one mole of ideal gas is 22.4 liters. Now, 200, 125 milliliter flask contains argon at 1.3 atmospheres and 7 degrees degree Celsius. What amount of argon is present in moles. And so you have to convert from Celsius to Calvin, so we add 273. Now, whether or not you use 273 or 273.15 depends on the number of sig figs for the Celsius. And so because we stop here at the ones unit, I stop here at the ones unit. And so 77 degrees Celsius corresponds to 350 Calvin. Now I have to convert from milliliters to liters. And so one liter corresponds to a thousand milliliters. And so milliliters will cancel and I'll be left with 0.125 liters. And so I've corrected my units and PV equals NRT. I asked, I'm asked about how many or what, what amount. And so that means I need the number of moles. So I take PV equals NRT divided by both sides by RT. It gives me this. And so my pressure is 1.3 atmosphere. My volume is 0.125 liters. 
Here's my gas constant. Again, I choose the one that has the pressure, the units that cancel. And my temperature is 350 Kelvin. And so again, if we want to do it on the calculator, we have 1.3 times 0.125 equals divided by 0 0.08206 equals and then divide by 350 and so it's a little confusing you know we divide twice we divide by 0 0.02 and we divide by 350 because they're all both below the the line and so then we count you know one two three and so that gives us 5.66 times 10 to the minus three moles Again, you watch your units. So atmospheres cancel atmospheres, liters, liters, Kelvin, Kelvin. We're left with one over one, one over one over a mole. And so that gives us a mole. So if the volume is double while the temperature number of moles is kept constant, what happens to the pressure? So if we start with the ideal gas law, P equals nRT, we can solve for R, which is a constant. And so divide both sides by NT, we get R is equal to PV over NT. Now this is kind of cool. What this means is that PV over NT at one time has to be equal to PV over NT at another time. And so I'm using final, F for final, and I for initial. Now, if we get rid of N and T because N is kept constant and T, so and T is kept constant, then that gives us P at PV equals PV. Now we're asked about what happens to the pressure. And so if you divide both sides by V final, we get this. And so if the volume is doubled, so V initial over V final equals one half, we see the final pressure is equal one half our initial pressure. But this equation here is really kind of cool. We can use it whenever the parameters change. And so again, this is the equation we talked about in the last slide. Now we could also solve for P final. And so divide both sides by V final. Uh, multiply both sides by n final t final and we get this and so to me that's really kind of a cool equation and so it tells you that if you increase the volume so v final bigger than v initial means the pressure will go down if you increase the number of moles the pressure would go up if you increase the temperature the pressure would go up so we've solved this equation in terms of final pressure we can also solve it in terms of final volume. And so if you increase the final pressure, the volume goes down. If you increase the final number of moles, volume goes up. If you increase the final temperature, volume goes up. And so if the temperatures increase from 50 to 100 degrees Celsius, while the number of moles and pressures kept constant, what happens to the volume? Now remember, temperature always has to be in Kelvin. And so we can add 273. And again, we can start with this equation here, which we got just by taking PV equals nRT, solving for R, and then PV over NT at one time equals PV over NT at another time. Now we're looking for the volume. Well, we could cancel the things that don't change. So number of moles and pressure constant, so NP cancels. And so that lists us V over T equals V over T. And so we're in solve for V sub F. And so if we multiply both sides by T sub F, we get final volume is equal to final temperature over initial temperature times initial volume. And so our 
final temperature is 373, initial temperature is 323, and so this would give us the uh, final volume. So a weather balloon had a radius of one meter when released at sea level at 20 degrees Celsius. It expanded to a radius of three meters when it raised, had risen to a maximum height where the temperature is minus 20. What is the pressure in the balloon at its new maximum altitude? And so when you have a balloon, typically you can assume that the internal pressure is equal to external pressure. It's not completely accurate, but it's a good enough approximation because of the elasticity of the balloon. And so we have to convert our units. So we need to go from Celsius to Kelvin. So 273 plus 20 gives us 293. 273 minus 20 gives us 253. Now we don't need to calculate the volume, just need to know the equation for the volume of the sphere. Volume of the sphere is equal to 4 thirds pi r cubed. So that's what we got there. And now we got PV over NT equals PV over NT. Again, subscripts F indicate final, subscripts I indicate initial. And so we're looking for, let's see what doesn't change. So the volume is going to change, the temperature is changing, ends not changing. So we could actually ca uh, cancel that out. And we're looking for P final. So P final is equal V initial V final times T final T initial times the P initial. And we have four thirds pi, four thirds pi. Those actually cancel out. So that gives us one over three times three is nine times three is 27. One over 27 times 253 over 293 times one. And so that gives us 0 0.032 atmospheres. So this equation is very helpful when you have more than one parameter changing. And again, you can solve it for either P final or, or V final, it just depends on what the problem is. If the volume's doubled, the temperature's tripled, and the number of moles is kept constant, what will be the final pressure if the initial pressure was at one atmosphere? So again, we can start with P equals NRT. We get to the here. We're looking for, well, N cancels, and then we're looking for the final pressure. So N cancels, it loses this. If we divide both sides by V final, and multiply both sides by T final, we get that. Then we can just plug in our number, V initial or V final. It's doubled, so we just put one over two. And then our T final, we have um, 819 over 273. And so we get this fraction here is three halves. And three halves times one gives us 1.5, so the final pressure would be 1.5 atmosphere. A CO2 gas in a gas tight syringe has a volume of 25 milliliters at 20 degrees Celsius. What's the final volume of the syringe if you raise the temperature to 40 degrees? And so again, we have to convert the units of temperature to Kelvin, and we might want to convert volume to liters. And so again, to get Kelvin, we add 273.15. And so 20 degrees Celsius corresponds to 93 Kelvin. 40 degrees Celsius corresponds to 313. And a couple of parameters are changing. So if it's gas tight, you can assume that N is constant. Our temperature is changing, our volume is changing and our pressure is probably the same. And so we can get rid of N and P, and we're looking for VF, so the, multiply both sides by TF, and then we can plug in our numbers, 
And so we're going from T out the final 313 divided by 293 times the 25 milliliters. And so that gives us 26.3 milliliters. Now, if you look at this equation here, you notice that whenever T final is greater than T initial, it means that V final will be greater than V initial. And that's the example of Charles' law. And so PV equals NRT. Now, if we divide both sides by V and RT, we get N over V equals P over RT. Now, N is the number of moles, and so it's going to be equal to total mass over molar mass. So remember, please remember, lowercase m is mass, capital M is molar mass. If we plug this in for N, we get this. So total mass divided by molar mass and volume is equal to P over RT. Multiply both sides by molar mass. Now, mass over volume is just density. And so it's kind of cool. We took the ideal gas law and we actually got an equation for the density of a gas. The density of a gas is equal to pressure times its molar mass over RT. And so the density of a gas is proportional to its molar mass. And so it used to be that dirigibles were filled with hydrogen gas because it was lighter. But after the Hindenburg, um, people started using helium for blimps because it's not combustible. And so bromine, its vapor is Br2, and so that's a molar mass of 160 grams per mole. Now, our atmospheric gas is 80% nitrogen, which has a molar mass of 28, and 20% oxygen, which has a molar mass of 32. And so if you think about 30, you know, the bromine gas is going to have a molar mass about five times greater than atmospheric than normal gas. Bromine vapor is roughly five times more dense than air. It can be poured from one flask to another. The density of bromine, like that of all gases, is directly proportional to the molecular mass of its molecules in the gas phase. So bromine gas is about five times more gas dense than air. So what's more dense, helium or sulfur hexafluoride? And so obviously it should be the sulfur hexafluoride. The molar mass of helium is 4, sulfur is 32, fluorine is 19, and so 6 times 19 would give you 114 plus 32 would give you 146. And so sulfur hexafluoride should be a lot more dense than helium. I promise to show you something really cool as long as you promise not to try it at home, okay? Okay. Now, everyone wants to know why my voice sounds higher when I inhale helium. Well, several factors is that helium is six times less dense than air, which means sound waves travel through it much faster, which makes my voice sound much higher. Now, the same effect can be achieved in reverse if I inhale something like sulfur hexafluoride, which is six times denser than air. I inhale some of that, and my voice gets really low, although somehow I'm still funny. <laughs> but the sound difference is really because his vocal cords will vibrate at a f lower frequency in the more dense gas and a higher frequency in the less dense gas. And so you could be asked in the future to put the gases in order of increase in density. So here we have nitrogen, helium, oxygen, chlorine, and argon. Now you got to remember the formulas. You know, nitrogen, oxygen, chlorine are all diatomic. Helium and argon are not. And so here's their molar masses. Remember density is proportional to the molar mass. 
And so the most dense one should be the chlorine and the least dense one should be the helium. And so what is the density in grams per liter of hydrogen sulfide at one atmosphere and two down at Calvin? And so D equals PM over RT. Now we have to get the molar mass. And so hydrogen has a molar mass of one. We got two hydrogen, gives us two. Molar mass of sulfur is 32. And so 32 plus two gives us a molar mass of 34 for H2S. And so density is pressure times the molar mass over RT. And so our pressure was one atmosphere. Molar mass is 34 grams. Again, we're using one atmosphere, and so we have to use this for the gas constant. And our temperature is 298 Kelvin. And so if we multiply this out, we get 1.3 grams per liter. So it's kind of cool. We're able to derive an equation for density based on the ideal gas law. In the ideal gas law, we assume intermolecular forces are negligible, and the volume of the gas particles is negligible. For this equation for density, we have to make the same assumptions. Density of air at 15 degrees Celsius and one atmosphere is 1.23 grams per liter. What is the molar mass of air? And so we started with density. Well, we have to convert from Celsius to Kelvin. And so 15 degrees Celsius corresponds to 288 Kelvin. Now we have equation D equals PM over RT. This time we're asked about M. So we solve for M. M is going to be equal to DRT over P. And then we can plug in our numbers. We're given density of 1.23. We use this gas constant, atmospheres cancel, uh, 288 Kelvin, and we get 29.1. So whenever you have an equation, you should be able to solve for any of the parameters of the equation. And please always watch your units. And so we see that liters cancel liters, Kelvin cancels Kelvin, atmospheres cancel atmospheres. And so we had used the ideal gas law equation to derive the equation for density. Now again, we have ideal gas equation. Now let's assume we have, say, a mixture of two gases. Well, the total pressure is going to be equal to the total number of moles RT over V. The total number of moles is equal to moles of gas A plus moles of gas B. Now if we multiply this out, we got N gas A RT over V. N gas B R2 over V. Now, this is referred to as the partial pressure of gas B. And so it's the pressure just due to gas B. This part here is the partial pressure of gas A. It's due to just the, it's the pressure due to just the gas A. And so what this tells us is that the total pressure is going to be equal to the sum of the partial pressures. And so that's Dalton's law of partial pressures. And again, we derived it from the ideal gas law. And so if we have uh, 0.32 atmospheres of water vapor and 0.16 atmospheres of oxygen gas, what's the total pressure in the flask? We just add those two together and that gives us 0.48 atmospheres. And so again, the sum of the partial pressures equals the total pressure. And again, because we derived it from the ideal gas law equation, it's independent of the type of gas. Now, often if you're doing an experiment and you're collecting gas, you're collecting the gas over water. And so the pressure inside the flask here is actually going to be due to the pressure of the gas that you collected plus the pressure of the water vapor. And so what is the partial pressure of oxygen gas collected at 200 degrees Celsius if atmospheric pressure is 760 torr? And so the total pressure is 760. Now the water vapor is going to be 23.76. And so 760 minus 23.76 will actually give us the pressure of just the oxygen. So again, when you're collecting gases over water, 
inside the flask is both the water vapor and the gas that you're collecting. And so a 44.8 liters of oxygen gas was collected at STP, how many moles of potassium chlorate must have decomposed. And so 44.8 is two moles. Remember at STP, one mole corresponds to 22.4. And so that corresponds to two moles of O2. And for the KCl2, you have that. So two divided by three would give you, can't do that with my head, two divided by three and then times two, or if we write this out, so 44.8 liters divided by 22.4, that gives you moles of O2. This fraction comes from the equation. So every two moles of the potassium chlorate gives you three moles of the O2. And so the moles of O2 cancel and the liters cancel, and you're left with 1.33 moles of the potassium chlorate. So PV equals NRT, ideal gas equation, pressure times volume equals number of moles times the gas constant times temperature. It gives you accurate results as long as you can assume intermolecular forces are negligible and the volume of the gas particles themselves are negligible. And typically, you can make those assumptions as long as the temperature is high enough and the pressure is low enough. If the temperature is too low, then intermolecular forces become important and the ideal gas law no longer yields accurate results. If the pressure is too high, then the volume of gas particles become important and the ideal gas law no longer yields accurate results. Now we took the ideal gas law and we're actually able to, to make these two equations and so if you have a lot of parameters changing at once, they're very helpful. They also show you how the pressure chair, uh, varies. So if you increase the volume, pressure goes down, increase number of moles, pressure goes up, increase in temperature, pressure goes up. We also use the ideal gas law to der derive an equation for density of gas. So it's equal to pressure, it's equal to pressure times the molar mass over RT. And so again, if you're using this equation, you have to make sure that intermolecular forces are negligible and the volume of gas particles are negligible. And then finally, we use the ideal gas law to derive Dalton's law of partial pressures. The sum of the partial pressures is equal to the total pressure. And again, we use the same approximations. Intermolecular forces are negligible and the volume of the gas particles are negligible. I hope that was helpful. You were snoring, Harley.